So welcome to another episode of the Go With John Show. We are here today with Ray Greenstreet of Green Street Gardens. Ray, thank you for coming in. Yeah, thanks for having me on this beautiful morning. I know, <laughs> rainy day. So you, you were telling us a little bit about the drive-in, how you hit a little traffic on the Wilson yeah, it's Bridge. it's a little thick out there right now. <laughs> so Ray, tell us a little bit about um, you know wh who you are and how did you end up becoming a, uh, a nursery grower? So I really started when I was young and I was 13 and needed a job like all the other kids do. Um, and uh, I was the yard boy. I worked for a big wholesale grower mm -hmm. um, that his wife had polio. And I would literally drive her around on the golf court, cart and she would say, plant the marigold there and plant that there. And then winter came and, you know, I started working in the greenhouses and um, it was called Cherry Bray. It was over in Clarksville, Maryland, Howard County. Of course, all that's gone now. It's all built up with homes. Mm -hmm. And um, I used to go out to school every day and, and work my tail off. We got paid 80% of minimum wage because wow. it was agriculture back then. So right. I started at 225 an hour. Wow. And I worked my tush off. Yeah, but you had fun. I had a great time. Um, it was... Uh, it was we had fifty Quonset houses, which are those little hoop houses, and right. they were not very sophisticated. You had to open and close doors and manually open and close windows. We grow a ton of bedding plants and perennials and things. And on the weekends, the family that we worked for was you know fairly religious, and they would go to you know their services things on the weekend. And it was me and a bunch of high school kids running the place, and it was my job to be the weekend manager and keep everything alive, you know, till Monday and, and water the flowers <laughs> and keep the kids from burning the place down or, you know, running around on the trucks or anything else. And I worked there all through high school. It was a great, it was a great education because it gave me the opportunity not to just, um, you know, flip burgers or anything, but it, you know, learn how to work on equipment. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'll, I'll tell you a little funny. We used to be the, the right way, the wrong way and the Cherry Bray way. And, you know, they were they were hardworking people and, and didn't have a lot of deep resources and, um, you know, had to keep things patched and working and generators running and, and heaters and things like that. But it was a great education in that it really taught me um, a lot about how like, a lot of life lessons. Mm -hmm. So and I've been in the ag agriculture business ever since I worked for a big interior escape company called um, Creative Plantings. Mm -hmm. And back in the 80s, um, right after I got out of school, I wasn't high school, I wasn't ready to go to college. And we did all the malls and, and hotels and stuff in Northern Virginia and DC market and Four Seasons Hotel and all those places. Um, that was when, you know, every office had plants in it. And right. by the way, I don't see one plant in this office. That's right. What's the problem? <laughs> Labor. So, <laughs> Labor. <laughs> so, um, and then I went away to college and uh, went to school out in Chicago. I was affiliated with a company called Ball Seed. Mm -hmm. Ball Seed is the um, premier breeder and broker for worldwide for plants. Mm -hmm. And and came back and uh, worked for Bell Nursery. Um, a lot of people know Bell Nursery now. They they supply a lot of the Home Depots and, and mm -hmm. some of the box stores with you know seasonal color. Back then, we were growing product, flowers and foliage and everything else to supply to Creative Plantings, which was the sister company and did all the interior scape. Okay. And chugged along and started doing a little bit of work with Depot. And one day, Ball Seed came in and said, hey, we want you to be a salesman. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went on the road, a 1099 employee. Mm -hmm. And um, and it, it was, that was a great education. I had, um, you know, Maryland for a number of years. And then one day I got a call and they said, hey, we want you to move to Long Island and take over the New York market. And my wife started crying. You know, we had a young son and our family and friends <laughs> are down here. And, you know, never, never a little bit of experience in New York, not much. So we went up and uh, bought a home on, on the eastern end of Long Island, a place called Wading River, right on the Long Island Sound. Beautiful country up there. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of people don't realize it, but I had all of Long Island, Rockland, uh, Westchester, and Fairfield, Connecticut was my uh, was my sales ter territory. Mm -hmm. And that was, you know, late 80s things. The economy was growing and going crazy. And um, I had all the Hamptons. They were all my customers. Um, they're, they're landscape contractors and growers right, right. were my customers. And um, 
you know, got to see what that was all about. And they would have a party on the weekend and they'd plant their whole place and landscape it. And then the next weekend they'd have another party and then midweek they'd take all the flowers out and put all new flowers in. Wow. Because they had the same guests come back and they didn't want to have the same flowers there, right? <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> That's um, crazy. But a lot of big commercial growers in Long Island. So Long Island, um, it's kind of an interesting place. You know, there, it, it, I always said you could you could have anything on Long Island that, that you want as long as you have the money. Great food and, mm -hmm. and great people. And um, uh, used to be all potato farms out there. Mm -hmm. And eventually it's turned into wineries and vineyards and, and greenhouses. But Long Island sticks out into the ocean, you know, 150 miles. Mm -hmm. And that eastern side of Long Island gets more light than South Carolina and Florida does because all the water reflects the light from the ocean yep, yep. back into that area. Yep. So it's a phenomenal growing area. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's plenty of good water and stuff. The biggest problem in Long Island is getting on off getting on and off the island right over the bridges um, yeah but uh yeah and that was always that was always a treat or grabbing a ferry or something to yeah get, still is today to get up yeah <laughs> oh, absolutely but um have a lot of passion for for the, my friends and and customers up there and what they do and um really kind of opened my eyes to a little bit different type of uh retailing mm -hmm. um they had a lot of farm stands i mean there's just one one after the next and uh, on the weekends, you know, everybody goes from these or from New York City, mm -hmm. Manhattan, out to the island, and they're mm -hmm. either going out um, to the South Fork, which is where the Hamptons and all that are, or they're going out and getting their pies and their fresh vegetables. Right. Um, so it was a it was a high drive, a lot of fun, uh, challenging um, territory, and um, and then eventually. Um, I promised my wife I would bring her back to Maryland one day. And I think if we probably stayed there another couple of years, we probably never would have left. But right. uh, um, but we came, we had the opportunity to buy one of our suppliers, one of Ball Seed's suppliers called Windmere. And they produce little vegetative cuttings. Mm -hmm. So seed, plants come either from seeds mm -hmm. or vegetative cuttings. And mm -hmm. um Back a long time ago when Martha Stewart started going and getting going, they had all this kind of no novelty uh, plant material and uh, proven winners. You probably heard that name. And yep, yep. Ball floor plant. And so the vegetative annuals and vegetative perennials and things, they don't, they're not good seed producers, mm -hmm. but they're great growers. And, you know, they cover a lot of space and they take, you know, the high heat and, and they grow really, you know, rapidly. So... Where do you produce those? So those stock plants, there's a nucleus block in Chicago or whatever, but the real stock plants are, are growing in Israel, um, Costa Rica, Nicaragua now, um, and uh, Kenya. So they have these huge, I mean, massive, massive farms and greenhouses. They're all, they're all um, screened for a thing called thrips, which is a little bug that can carry, you know, viruses around. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they put all these yellow cards, sticky cards up and, and check for uh, check for the bugs and things. And then there's different um, quarantine levels. So um, back, you know, with the terrace and all that was going on, one of the things that's most popular in the market, right, is petunias. You see these great big, huge petunias in somebody's yard or in these massive hanging baskets or these calabracoes, they call them, or mini mm -hmm. petunias. Um but they're actually on the terrace watch list because they're a host to Rostonia. And Rostonia is kind of what created the great potato famine. And the government, U.S. government, was always afraid that somebody would infect the farm and then they would bring this disease into the country. So you go in the, your white suit, you go in that house, and you go through the ammonia bath with your feet. Um, and then every time they take one of those little cuttings, they, they change their knives. And it's very sterile. It's, it's almost like surgery. Wow. It's unbelievable. And um, they harvest all these cuttings, and then they pack them and cool them. They have to get the heat out of them because it's, you know, very warm down there. And then they're flown in, into Miami or they're flown into uh, uh, New York, and they go through a USDA inspection mm -hmm. very quickly. Everything has a barcode on it, so you know the variety, but you also know a greenhouse, when it was cut, who the cutter was. So if there was ever an issue with anything, you could always trace back. Mm -hmm. um, so then those cuttings get delivered to, to our farm, um, usually by FedEx or, or a truck. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have, you know, 
about 24 to 48 hours to get them stuck because there's no roots, right? You can't bring yep. soil in yep. from other countries. So so, uh, so you have the bare roots, right? So they all come in. They're so little I'll, tiny, yep. you know, little plastic bags with a label. It looks like, it almost looks like drugs coming in, right? Because <laughs> they're all these little packets. And then yeah. and we have to sort them. You know, we grow a lot, a lot of different varieties. Yeah. And then we root them from about four to five weeks. And then once they're rooted, we put 100 in a tray or 50 in a tray. And then we ship them out to other growers. It's really their starter plants. Mm -hmm. um, so that was when we bought Windmere, that was really their uh, predominant focus, mm -hmm. which is now Green Street Growers. And in my heart, I always loved Long Island. I love the growers and I love the, um, the garden centers and things up there and the farm stands. So one of my goals right after we purchased Windmere was to open up our own garden center. And uh, we're on 65 acres there and uh, we took part of the old tobacco farm and you know, built greenhouses. And we also built a, a garden center, year-round uh, garden center. Mm -hmm. um, and things were jogging along pretty good. And then we had the big old, good old recession you now came. And that was that was hard with that. Typically, you know, we always say the plant industry is a little bit recession, recession proof mm -hmm. because it's such a long season. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know it's it's kind of years in, a, in the turn and usually the economy you know kind of corrects itself in that period but this as everybody knows that recession lasted a really long time Wh which recession either? so that was back in 2008 seven, okay nine, the financial you know, yeah. yeah we talk about that a lot here on this show yeah. so yeah. It, it really impacted us so a lot of our uh, medium-sized customers that bought these liners these starter plants they kind of disappeared. Either they got smaller or they mm -hmm. got bought out or they said, forget this business. I'm out of here, you know, mm -hmm. or they went, you know, they went belly up. Um, so I really decided that we had to diversify. Now, my wife, I'll tell you, we're too diversified. But, you know, you mentioned labor with the horticulture business. You know, there's a couple big peaks. You know, you have a big peak in the spring and a big peak in the fall and mm -hmm. a little peak of the Christmas. And then when I was a kid and working in there, you would just get laid off. They would just lay everybody off between those peaks and valleys. Mm -hmm. And you can't do that anymore because you never get your staff back. Right. <laughs> so, you know, between the recession and trying to, you know, make sure that we really built a strong team was to figure out what else we could do to diversify. And one, you know, we, we purchased another garden center right in the middle of the recession, which, which was not an easy thing to do mm -hmm. with the bank. And that's right over here uh, in Alexandria off of Braddock Road. Mm -hmm. And um, pretty insulated, right, from from that type of the economy. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of old money down there and passionate gardeners and, and homes from, you know, small homes to, you know, large estates. Mm -hmm. So that was a real gem. That really helped us. And then we got into green walls. So we do a lot of commercial green walls. That's what you really need mm -hmm. in here. Clean, clean all the cleans the air and right, right. gives you know makes your uh, guests a little bit more relaxed, and, right, <laughs> and um, makes your brain work a little bit better. Um, so we do that. We're doing those, you know, all through uh, Baltimore, Northern Virginia. We just put one down in uh, Alabama mm -hmm. at uh, Bonnie Plants, who grows a lot of uh, uh, vegetables uh, for the box stores. Mm -hmm. They have a new office. We just put one in there. Um, we do our own residential landscape. We don't do commercial landscape because we supply the plants to the commercial um, properties. Just like you're building here. They got pansies out front right now. And, you know, hopefully in a few weeks, if it warms up a little bit, we'll start getting some of the other neat items that we grow. But so we ship into Northern Virginia, Baltimore, Washington, mm -hmm. um, Delaware, more to the Eastern shore. It's kind of amazing what's happening on the Maryland Eastern Shore in Delaware. Right. Uh, more and more commercial places in Berlin and other places. We ship over there, Cambridge. Um, and then we'll go as far north as uh, North or, uh, New York and as far south right now mm -hmm. as, as North Carolina. Mm -hmm. So we're bringing the seasonal color. Right. Um, and that's one of the things. And we grow millions of millions of those things. Yeah. And, uh, so, so tell me a little more about a green wall. So how do you how do you install a green wall? So we have a patented um, technology, mm -hmm. and it's almost like uh, siding on a house, but it's it's a double panel wall, mm -hmm. and we pressurize it. Okay. And then we have a patented nozzle, so we bring the ambient air from a room or from a conference room, mm -hmm. and we push it into the wall. And then this nozzle delivers the moisture, the air, into the root zone, what's called the rhizosphere. And um, 
and we actually force the moisture and the air together in the rhizosphere where the roots are. And the microbials and all the things that are growing in the soil actually break down the VOCs, the volatile organic compounds. Mm -hmm. um, so this process was um, first kind of discovered back in the 70s uh, with the Dr. Wolverton and NASA. And they were trying to figure out how to clean the space station mm -hmm. because with all electronics and the canned air and stuff, you know, you can't open the window and a little fresh air in. Oh, and, you know, bad. pollutants were a, really, were a really big thing. And what he found is um, typical houseplants, typical tropical foliage plants, actually clean the air. Mm -hmm. But most people think they clean the air of, you know, you have a spath here or a piece of lily sitting here in the corner – which you don't, by the way, but I'll send you one. And um, <laughs> and uh, and that thing cleans the air. But really, it's doing a little bit, but it's just kind of sitting there. What the research really showed is that um, forcing air into the root zone, right? It's a it's a symbiotic relationship between the plants and the bacteria that grow naturally in the soil. It's exactly what happens outside. Mm -hmm. um, so the plant is kind of the inoculant. It's the engine. It's producing the sugars to feed all these different good bacteria. And when those those uh, VOCs come in there, it actually chews them up and breaks them down, and, and it really becomes food for, for them and the plant. It's pretty amazing. Um, so we developed this technology. Um, and we've got a new wall that we're working on right now to get out. We got stalled a little bit with... Um, with COVID and, and supply issues. And, mm -hmm. um, but we're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel with that. Um, the wall that we just put up down in, uh, down in, uh, Monty plants is our newer, newer technology. Mm -hmm. And we can do it. We can grow agricultural plants with it. We can, um, we can make smaller units that will actually be like a desktop or in your home. Mm -hmm. Um, it's really cool. And the neat thing about it is we we're putting, you know, led light has gotten to be, huge you know it's huge in your offices right and in the homes but one of the biggest drivers of led lights is the cannabis market mm -hmm. because they need as much light as they can to produce um you know the right type of you know thcs and all those other things mm -hmm. um and you know we get these i get these industry magazines and they got a strawberry and they got a led light over top of it it's changed a little bit now but when it was first you know kind of taboo to talk about it you know they cheer you the strawberry but you knew what they were really talking about <laughs> talking about <laughs> growing <laughs> cannabis and um and i'm not advocating it one way or the other but it, it was a huge driver for g or for general electric and Phillips and these people that make this different type of lighting. So we're stealing that technology mm -hmm. and buying LED lights to con to grow the uh, green walls. So our green walls are much different. You know, there's other green walls that are out there and they, they hang pots on a wall and right. um, and they're beautiful and you get the aesthetics out of it. But ours is really two function. One, it's, it's cleaning the air and it's also adding, you know, um, the ambiance to your office and, right. and, you know, there's all kinds of research, you know, about what plants do. And it was interesting with COVID. One of the things it really did was really drove people back into the house plant and foliage market. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. back in the eighties, when I was with creative and nineties, and, and the foliage market was just booming out of Florida because most of the foliage is grown in Florida. And over those last 20, 25 years, you know, it really was starting to go south and, you know, the nurseries were kind of slowing down, expanding, and they were building homes down in Florida. Right. And then COVID hit and the foliage market and the houseplant market and the succulent market went berserk. Yeah, I, bet. I mean, berserk. Yeah, and the home and, building market. And yeah. Yeah. And um, so, you know, everything kind of comes and goes around. So back in the 70s and 80s and 90s, it was plants were everywhere. And then it, the commercial properties and homes kind of went more to the artwork and fancy tables and things right. like that. And now I, there's a trend that it's kind of moving back to the middle again, like everything does. Mm -hmm. And um, and also the younger generation, um, they want they want something easy, mm -hmm. you know, and that's why the succulent business has really kind of gotten huge. So we grow a lot of succulents, and they're just little two-and-a-half-inch plants. And um, it's a good thing, you know. It's – Everybody needs something green in your life, right? Mm -hmm. And it makes you healthier. It helps your brain, mm -hmm. helps you relax, you have to get off the beltway. And um, 
<laughs> I feel I feel very very badly that we don't have. I know I'm sitting in this naked you. studio <laughs> and I'm gonna I'm gonna send some things down. Uh, but you know, and and it also it's a natural way to add humidity back into your room. Right. You know, one of the things I kept texting our governor and our um, county exact is when this COVID thing was going on is to tell people to open the windows. I mean, yeah. it's. You know what? And what happens with COVID and those other viruses was when the air is dry, mm -hmm. that just stuff floats around, floats around, floats around. Yeah. But if there's a little bit of humidity in the air, right? You open the window, it, the moisture molecules attach to that virus, mm -hmm. and it settles to the floor. Mm -hmm. So we never shut. We were, you know, we're deemed agriculture, so we stayed open. Our stores stayed open. Our business stayed open. You know, at peak, we have 175 employees now. Wow. We never shut down one day for COVID. Mm -hmm. We were open seven days a week, just like we were. We had customers coming into our store because we, you know, we really transitioned to foliage and, and more vegetables and gardening and you know, so people could grow their own stuff. Um, and I think, you know, knock on wood, over that period of time, we had four or five cases of COVID mm -hmm. and that was it. Yeah, well, you're you're mostly outdoors. Yeah, we're outdoors, but you know, we're I have a you know the one thing about agriculture that I think a lot of people don't realize is, you know, you're not just driving a tractor anymore. Right. You know, it's you know you have to have the social media and you have to have the marketing and you have to have the databases yep. to know where all your plants are. We have a you know we use a SQL database, so we manage all these you know jobs across this market, so we know what's been in there for the last number of years. Mm -hmm. And a lot mm -hmm. of times we we have data it's more accessible to us than the landscapers because we're tracking all that you know when i work for ball we convert it from their old system to a sap sap is a, a database system out of germany and everything's looked at the line level so mm -hmm. you put all the all the information about this plastic bottle in there you know mm -hmm. and you have all these different products we do the same thing with our plants so we're tracking the color the size the growth um any attributes that we want to track um and then we can produce phenomenal reports and projections as far as what we're going to grow the next year. And, mm -hmm. you know, because I, I guarantee along with Foster and every other you know, Four Seasons or wherever, they're not thinking about what they're going to have next spring out in front of their sidewalk. Right. But we have to start, you know, it's a huge, very long chain of life from the nucleus block to the stock block to the mother plants. You know, so it's, you know, we need to be, we're like the clothes, clothing business. We're eight, nine, 10 months, 12 months out. You know, mm. and COVID's create a lot of challenges in our industry, uh, especially with pots and soil, things you just wouldn't think about. And, um, you know, we're looking at going ahead and ordering supplies for 2023 and 24 now to see if we can try to get ahead of the curve. Mm -hmm. um, but our motto is success grows here. And we truly mean it. You know, I want my staff to think about when a customer comes in, either wholesale or, or retail, what are the you know what are the pieces that you need to be successful uh, in your home or your building, um, and that is not just buying the plant. You know we want to make sure that you know understand about the fertilizer or you know maybe you need something for your roses or mm -hmm. um, the garden center business and the plant business. It's really like baking a cake, mm -hmm. right? You need two eggs, cup of milk, a little bit of sugar, whatever you need. And that's how you bake a cake, right? right? And everybody can follow that recipe. Um, and our industry is very much like that, you know. So here are the parts and pieces. So if you're a novice, a lot of times people say, oh, well, I don't know enough about gardening to go into a garden center. I'll go to Depot because I don't know. I don't know. Right, about. right. Well, that's, you know, we don't want that. We want them right. to come to the independent garden centers. Right. Um, but learning to grow one type of plant or a couple of plants and then it's like, you know, reading a book, you kind of get addicted. And then you next year you try something new and the next year you try something new. And and that's what we want. You know, mm -hmm. um, the Washington market does a great job with, you know, plants and color and perennials. And, and whether you want a native plant or, um, you know, I, I think, you know, a yard, your commercial property or your residential should be a blend of, you know, some natives and some other species that work well in this area. Mm -hmm. And a little pop of color, right? Right. Let's you know, let's let's make it a beautiful world. And there's certainly all those tools and and things you need. Um, 
soil is a super important thing. You know, we push a product called bumper crop, which is, um, it's kind of like what your grandmother, if you were ever, had a grandmother that was in a gardening and it, it's got, you know, lobster compost in it and it's got um, some seaweed and worm castings and all that stuff. Because what happens with some gardeners, especially new ones, they say, oh, you know, your flowers are beautiful. You know, mine look terrible. Well, it's not that, that you're that much better of a gardener. You've just put a little bit of those extra things in the soil. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it, it adds porosity to the soil and nutrient hold of capacity. And, mm-hmm. and that's really what makes it successful. So we push, we push soil amendments. There's, you know, so we've been using bumper crop. It's a great product. Um, there's also so a move to, uh, we just started getting in a, some products that actually are using local food waste. Right. As a compost to, uh, so we're using that. Uh, there's a new company just started where we were talking about them yesterday and uh, it's, it's a group of vets that um, that are starting some different types of compost. And one of the ones that they're talking about, the one is a compost to crab shell. Wow. Um, there used to be a place, there used to be a company when we first started probably probably 15 years ago that sold a compost crab shell um, product. And so why is that so important? Well, it's a natural way to add calcium and and all those building agents to your to your soil, mm-hmm. and they ran into some problems, you know, with where to compost it because you can imagine what a, you know, stack of crab shell smell like in the <laughs> summertime. Um, so uh, we bring this product now that has uh, lobster compost, but there's now a, a Maryland company that's going to start uh, doing the crab shell. So we're going to introduce that this spring. Uh, we'll start getting some of the stuff into our stores. So uh, it's all about the roots. You know, it's no different than the green wall. Right. You know. You keep the soil and the roots happy and uh, to get the right porosity and stuff in there. Um, those are really the keys to, keys to success. Mm-hmm. We just wrapped up a great conversation with Ray Greenstreet with GreenstreetGardens.com. Take a listen to his episode. You're going to really hear how passionate he is about gardening. If you have questions about gardening, send it to in the dirt at GreenstreetGrowers.com. If you want to visit his retail website, check him out at GreenStreetGardens.com. Ray Greenstreet, great story, great product, three locations, one in Maryland, two in Virginia. You can find them online. When you get in touch with them over there at Green Street, let them know that you heard them here on the Go With John Show. So, so talk a little bit. I know one of the things that uh, you're passionate about is gardening and health. So what do you, what do you what do you say to folks? Because we we live in such a busy world right now, where uh, a lot of folks outsource their gardening to a uh, to a, to to a neighborhood kid or to a landscaping company. Uh, how important do you think it is for folks to get out and and spend a little time outside in the yard? And it's uh, it's, it's great. It's great exercise. You know. I'm trying to lose weight right now. You know, I put my COVID weight on and my wife's got me on a diet, you know. Um, but, uh, you know, getting out and, and just touching the earth. And and um, we have a farm near us that she's doing a lot of the detox work with, with people with what they eat and mm-hmm. uh, farm to table and all those types of things. But really just getting your hands dirty. And, uh, you know, a lot of people say, oh, it's, you know, so much work. Don't take on too much. You right. know, a small raised bed in your backyard – We'll produce, you know, put a couple tomato plants and some squash and, you know, it'll it'll produce a lot. Um, mm-hmm. There's a really neat new tomato coming out that we're going to grow. We're going to start growing it next winter. And it's it's a tiny little tomato plant, tiny, um, really tight, and compact. And it has a very small, round, red tomato. And, you know, we're going to start selling them through the winter next year. So you can take the plant home, pick the tomatoes right off it, and put it in your salad. Wow. How, f- how fresh can you be, right? Right, right. So there's like um, cherry tomatoes, or are they going to be yeah, a little different? Yeah, it's maybe a little smaller than a cherry tomato. Okay. So the taste? plant itself is, you know, it's going to almost look like a, uh, you know, small house plant. Yeah. And the idea is to sell it with the fruit already on it. Mm-hmm. And literally, you know, put it on your table and you have your guest over and, you know, pick a couple tomatoes and put it in your salad, <laughs> right? How cool is that? <laughs> that is cool. Um, there's some peppers and some other things that are coming out too. But getting out, breaking a sweat, getting your hands in the soil, you know, watering. You know, watering, you know, some people complain about watering, but, um, you know, we're in D.C. It gets hot and dry, right? Right. So, you know, pour yourself a glass of nice wine, go outside. Take a little breath and water. Um, it's interesting in the wintertime. Um, 
especially you know this year, last couple of years with COVID and being a cold winter, we'll have people come into our garden center mm -hmm. and they want to come in there and walk around and, decom and decompress before they go home. Right. They want to get the beltway off their mind. They want to get their boss off their mind. Right. And, you know, people need green. Yes. You know? And um, that's, it's super important. So there's 21 million new gardeners as of COVID. Mm. And, I believe that. Yeah. Um, so um, a lot of it was gardening was, you know, flower or vegetables and, and things. Um, and I've been talking to, you know, our, some of our industry, you know, uh, leading people and I'm like, well, is that all going to switch off? Because now, you know, people are back out and they're going to Ocean City. The theory is no. And because when they in, they interviewed a lot of these people and our demographic has always been female, right? Mm -hmm. Our industries caters to probably 80 percent female. Um, but what they got this, with the 21 new uh, gardeners was a lot of males. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when they were interviewed, most people said they just didn't budget any time. They didn't think it was important, so they didn't budget the time for it. And asked, you know, are you going to keep gardening? And, and yes, it's become mm -hmm. an important part of their life. You know, I started when I was 13, and uh, and um, agriculture is a great way, or landscaping, to get your son or daughter from – you know, being in the house, out to having a job. Mm -hmm. Because is it going to be work? Yeah, it's going to be hard work. You know, you're you know, planting and putting stuff together. But agriculture has become so diversified because, you know, we need a computer person and we need this and we right. need that and we need the plants. And um, that it's always been a big goal of mine ever since we started our business to hire Kids, hire some kids. And mm -hmm. you could say, oh, he's, you know, he's cheap. He doesn't want to pay him, you know, mm -hmm. whatever. But to me, it's a way of kind of giving back um, to the community and to these kids. And some of them will stay in it. A lot of them won't. But let me tell you, you go work for a farm or garden center or landscape company, you're going to get a lot of good life lessons. Mm -hmm. You know, you're going to know how to change a tire and you're going to know how to break a little bit of a sweat. And um, you're going to understand about how things grow and, and work. You know, it, it's not like going up to an ATM and you push the button and the money comes out. Right. Right. You know, you got to know about heat, cooling and fertilization and transplanting and spacing and, you know, and just orders. I mean, we, you know, we produce, I don't know how many tens of thousands of orders we do a year, but you've got to read the pick list and you've got to load the carts and you've got to be able to count. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you a funny story, you know? So in our industry, there's a gazillion different size pots and trays. Yes. And how many pots in a tray, right? Right. Most of this market, there's 15 pots in a four and a half inch, or a tray holds 15 four and a half inch pots. Right. So when we were trying to do our pot design and stuff, we went to 10. And it, it, and do you know the reason why we went to 10? No, but you'll let me know. Yeah. Because nobody can count in multiples of 15. Oh, makes perfect sense. You count in multiples of 10. Right. Because we got to count when we load up, pull them. We got to count before we put them on the truck. Right. And, you know, you ask somebody to count in multiples of 15, they got to pull their phone out. Yeah. <laughs> so, but. That um, is right. But, you know, one of my big concerns, you know, and, and I've talked to some of the politicians and pushing a little bit is, and this is going to sound ter terrible to everybody, but as they increase the minimum wage, you're killing the opportunity for young folks to mm -hmm. get a job, get mm -hmm. out of the house, get away from their parents, yep. and get a little independence. Right. And, you know, I'm advocating a two-level minimum wage, right? Right. So it makes perfect sense. Somebody that gets a work permit who's 14 years old so maybe they're 16 years old or something. Yeah. You know, here's the beginning range. And, then, you know, they do a great job. Then great. Pay them more. Yeah. But you can't. Businesses can't afford to pay somebody who's 14, 15, 16. The current, you know, the minimum wages that are out there. Mm -hmm. So that's why you see, you know, um, McDonald's adding in machines. You know, I just saw that. I think it was either first Whole Foods or something's going to be 100 percent automated checkout. Right. Um, folks, we're killing, we're killing it. We're killing the next generation. You know, they're going to have to go through high school, college, get their first job. Mm -hmm. They're not going to be worth 
anything for a long time. That. Yeah. And, um, you know, we really need to think about that and, and what we, you know, what we need to do to encourage young people to get out and contribute a little bit, buy some of their own gas and pay a little bit of their insurance or, mm-hmm. you know, a little bit of their spending money. Um, we've got to teach them. You've got to teach them how to, they have to have a work ethic. Yeah. And, um, you know, and I'll, I'll just dovetail on that. I've got uh, my kids are I've two two boys, 13 years old. They're going to be 14 uh, here later this year. And uh, we've got a we've got a farm out in Woodstock, Virginia, and they have to work it. You know, we don't have a lot of labor out there and we get we get the liners in and we've got to plant them and we've got to get them in pots and set them up in the irrigation. And they absolutely hate it when we get started it, it it is a fight to get them dressed it is a fight to get them out um you know to to the to the work area but once we get 20 or 30 or 40 minutes uh into the work day something takes over there's a spirit and energy um they get passionate about the mission that we're trying to accomplish and it is hard work and you do break a sweat and you are sore at the end of the day but when you're sitting around with your family and you've worked a hard day or a hard two days or a hard three days, there's 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 a bond that you get uh, with everybody that you've worked with. You've got a team. And I'm sure the same exact thing happens with the young folks that come and work at your facility. They they're, they're not with their parents and they're not with their family, but they're with their work family. And it, it, it is hard and it does. It, it is hard to get started. But what you get out of it is so much more than the money. Yeah, we've had a lot of students that have, you know, gone on to college and a lot of them come back and, you know, work, you know, for us for a while before they moved on to something else. And some of them are still, you know, some of them are still here. And yeah. um, it's a win win, you know, yeah. and, and whether you're working for, you know, Depot or you know, McDonald's or something, any job is better than nothing. You right. Know, you, you know, you need to be we need to get these kids out there and, and, and teach them and, you know, not everything could be behind a computer, you yeah, know, and, and yeah. there's, you know, I'm, I'm an avid tech guy and, you know, have all the latest and greatest gadgets and things and apps, but, um, you do need to connect to nature. You do need to know how to do some things because God forbid, if anything really happened to this country, you know, you gotta be able to survive. Right. And yeah. the first thing they're going to cut off is the computer. Yes. Right. <laughs> and then what are you going to do? I know. Exactly. So, you know, and, and there's some real satisfaction getting your family out. It's a good, gardening is a great way to get everybody out yeah. and kind of work together. You know, whether you're doing your trees or you just grow a simple vegetable garden. Yeah. You know, I, re- and, I recommend the vegetable garden, you know, yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, for us that are getting a little bit older, you know, we have raised bed, you know, you don't have to bend all the way over. Anymore. Right, right, right. Raise the bed and, and do some of those different things. And if you travel a lot, there's easy ways now to put some drip irrigation out there to yeah. keep things kind of running along. Um, and the, the, the really young generation, they love it. Mm-hmm. Get out there with their hands and the mud yep. and the dirt and the yep. water can. And, and then you see those first, um, Flowers are those first vegetables, you know, starting to come in. Um, so it's like anything. Don't don't go too big in the beginning. Mm-hmm. You know, build on it. Right. Um, so it doesn't become a burden. Yeah. And the, what you really want it to do is become something that, you know, you look forward to. Mm-hmm. And same thing in the house, you know. Get a few plants. You know, put some plants in your mm-hmm. kid's room. Let them take care of them. And um, it's amazing how, you know, young, I'm talking about like elementary kids right. are really connected, you know. Um, so we have a lot of events. We do, you know, Easter egg hunt and we do all these other different events and things. And and I have one of our friends a number of years ago goes, you know, I, I can't go down 258 anymore. I'm like, well, this is in Maryland. Why? Well, every time we get close to your garden center, my son wants to come in and we have to stop, you know. So, you know, there's definitely a connection. The earlier you can get that connection with your kids. Yeah. Um, the better it is and, and just teach them teach them some of the basics. Yeah. So, Ray, what are some of the most important life lessons that you think you've learned that you can share with folks out there that that relate to gardening and and farming? I, I guess it just, you know, develop a passion, you know, get out there, get your hands dirty, get get a couple of plants, try something, you know, you're going to kill something. It's, you know, it's going to happen. You forget the water or you went away mm-hmm. for a long weekend or whatever, you know, okay, that's fine. You know, learn from it, learn how to propagate a little bit. Um, and, um, 
to me, it's easy. It just kind of comes natural as you're as you're a grower, and for long as I've been doing it, you know, I can walk in a greenhouse. I don't need to look at the temperature on the computer, or I can just tell you. You can feel it. I can feel it. Yeah. If it's the humidity right, is light right. Yeah. So, you know, our industry, like many others, has gotten much more advanced. So we talked a little bit about the lighting. And mm -hmm. um, there's now work with we're putting uh, hydrogen peroxide bubbles into the water, the irrigation water, to help um, um, be a cleaner and safer way to control disease and things. Um how the equipment works. You know, we've got houses that are glass houses, which is the best light transmission. Unfortunately, as you know, as a builder, it's the worst you can have because you lose all your heat, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so we have what they call a shade curtains and heat retention curtains. And it's just like a big blanket we pull at night, you know, up automatically. Mm -hmm. And it holds all that heat in. Mm -hmm. um, when we built our new range, um, we shipped everything from Holland. And you said, why did you bring it from Holland? Well, at the time... The euro was kind of in the tank. Yeah. Um, but the technology from, from Holland was much better than the technology here at the time. Um, so all our motors have um, frequency drives. So when we spin the motor as fast as we need so we get enough energy. So, you know, you turn a motor or a fan or bathroom fan in your house, it's spin at 60 hertz. Mm -hmm. and all of the U.S. motors spin at 60 hertz. We have them. We have. We look at the water and how much we need, and maybe we only run thirty hertz, twenty mm -hmm. hertz, so that you're not burning so much energy up. Mm -hmm. um, we have, you know, the greenhouses have weather stations because we have to know what's going on. We have to tell the computer that the wind's blowing from which direction. You know, what's the you know air temperature? What's the humidity? So in our um, heating system, we use a hot water system similar to, you know. Upgraded homes, so not, not a hot air system, but hot water. And we use radiant heat. But we run a mathematical calculation based on the wind, what target temperature you are, the light levels. And it puts just enough BTUs in those pipes so that you maintain. Now, you can't go from 40 degrees to 70 degrees in a second. You know, it takes hours. Mm -hmm. But when you look at the um, our heating uh, charts, it's just this steady, almost flat line all the way across mm -hmm. um, versus having a home where it maybe goes up to 70, goes down to 65, goes mm -hmm. to 70. Well, it, it goes to 70 and cuts off, but you still have all that retained heat in your furnace. Right. And maybe it goes to 72. Well, those two or three extra degrees is a huge waste of energy because you've overshot your goal. Right. right. So um, the technology that we have is is um, is one that it, – it, it's constantly looking at what do I need to put in there? Mm -hmm. So a lot of times you walk in the greenhouse and you touch a pipe and you think, oh, it should be like red hot. And it's actually just kind of warm, you know. Um, it's amazing how, you know, how all that works and how well that that works. So uh, there's a lot of, uh, you know, energy is a, a big part of our industry. And, uh, you know, we're all looking to, to improve ways, to, you know, ways to do it and, and be more efficient. There's a thing um, – that we can do this time of year. So, you know, you want a nice plant when you buy it at the store, but you don't want something that's really tall and floppy. We call mm -hmm. it leggy, mm -hmm. right? But what we can do with the computers and stuff now is if we crash the temperature 30 minutes before sunrise, that's called a negative diff. Mm -hmm. And what the plant thinks is that the day temperature um, is cooler than the night temperature. And what that does is it keeps the plant nice and tight without having to put growth regulators on it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's called a negative dip. Now, same thing if poinsettias are a little short, we can do it the other way and do a positive dip and pick up a couple, you know, a couple more inches or an inch or so something. So you don't just put it in the ground and let it grow? No, it's there's a lot there's a lot to it, you know, and, and pest control yeah. and what we're trying to do for that, you know, we use a program called integrated pest management. So we right. put yellow sticky cards because bugs do go to yellow. So right. you know, you see these ladies and they have a beautiful yellow dress on in the spring and stuff and they're covered with bugs. It's not your perfume. <laughs> it's the color of your dress. Um, and so we put these little, you know, I guess they're like a three by five, almost like an index card. Right. And there's glue on both sides of them. We just yeah. stick them through the greenhouses so that we can monitor any, you know, any types of pests. We use um, biological control um, for all our herbs and vegetables so that uh, we don't have to use any, 
any you know man-made insecticide. Mm-hmm. So we'd use these predator insects, and they're they're like cannibals. They go out there and they eat these things and tear their head off, and um, and then we bring them in every week and we release you know call it releasing right. Yeah. Um, we do it in the evening when it's dark, and then we have these things called banker plants. And you say, what's a banker plant? Banker plants are plants that produce a lot of pollen Mm -hmm. so that when they gobble up all the aphids, right, or all the thrips, then they would just die or they would eat each other, right? Um, Survival of the fittest. So these banker plants produce a lot of pollen and other things that they can feed on and let that population come back up. So, you know, it's interesting with the U.S. market, um, everybody wants to be green and safe, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Until you get a bug, and then everybody's ready to come in with, you know, pesticides with everything. Yeah, and you know, pesticides have changed so much since I, you know, was a kid. And you know, most of the things that growers are using now um, are very safe. They're safer than what's under your kitchen sink. Mm-hmm. So if you look at your oven cleaner, especially, and some of the other things you use in your in your house, it, your label either says caution, warning, or danger. Most of the things in your house, your cleaning products, are. Um, a warning or a danger. Almost everything we use in the greenhouse business now is, carries a caution label. Mm-hmm. And um, and by using an integrated pest management, then you really target versus when I was a kid, you used to go in with like a nape bomb and you would spray everything, right? You know, every week, <laughs> you just spray, spray, spray. Right. Um, but we've all learned to be much more environmentally conscious and safer Um and use softer types of things. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe it's an oil or, or some of these other things um, so that we're, we're careful of the environment and careful of the plants or we use predatory, you know, insects, mm-hmm. use the sticky cards. There's, there's a lot of things that we do. And also starting with clean stock um, offshore and bringing it in, you know, clean plant in, clean plant out, right? Right, right. Um, just like any, any other industry. I'll tell you a funny story. So we bring a lot of plants in from Israel. And mm-hmm. a lot of people are amazed, well, you know, why is Israel? So Israel has a huge agriculture um, market. And, you know, it's a very small country, but it's very diversified. So if you go down south, it's kind of like you're in Egypt with the sand, right? And you go north, it's greener. And um, so I went to Egypt. I mean, I went to Israel probably about five or ten years ago. And um, everything there, they they – not to be gross in the morning, but they have uh, regular water or gray water, right? Mm-hmm. So when you go to the hotel, there's, you know, you have two different buttons on your toilet. You know, right. You know, solids or gray water, right? Right, right. And they take most of the gray water. Everything's double piped there, like mm-hmm. in Tel Aviv. And then that gray water goes out to the farm mm-hmm. for irrigation. Because in Israel, you know, it's basically a desert. So if it's not irrigated, it's dead. I mean, it's just, there's no, it's the driest place you know, I've ever really been. Um, But it's amazing what they can do. And because of being such in a dry environment, low humidity, they don't have a lot of pests and diseases. So it can, you know, it stays really clean. So we go to these farms and it's not like, I mean, these are acres and acres and acres of, you know, of uh, greenhouses and things. And you put a white, you know, you come in clean, you, you know, take your clothes off or you put a white, you know, Mm -hmm. surgical suit on uh, put booties on your feet and, you know, gloves in your hands and a hairnet, the whole nine yards. Because if you were carrying a pest or something, they don't want you to bring it into their clean environment. Right. But one of the other things you go through is you walk through these um, ammonia baths. Mm-hmm. And the farm delivery trucks that are coming in, they drive. They're just like a big pit, right? Yeah. And it's full of ammonia. And you drive these trucks or you have these what they call like a, it's like a floor mat, right? But it's wet. Yeah. And you, you walk on that with your feet. So I'm there for a week, right? We're going to, you know, all these different places and visiting all these different types of production from uh, herbs and vegetables. Uh, they do a lot of, um, they do a lot of uh, splicing of different types of tomatoes and different types of um, rootstock and things, right? Um, so anyway, of course, you know they're worried about tariffs, right? Especially ten years ago, back there. So I go to the airport. So I didn't really think about it. So I go to the airport. I put all my luggage, all my dirty clothes in my in my suitcase, and I walk into Tel Aviv Airport, which right. is unbelievably secure, right? Immaculate, right? And guess what? All the bells and whistles go off in the middle of the airport with me because my luggage is full of ammonia. 
<laughs> so I'm standing there in the middle of the Tel Aviv airport yeah. and literally, you know, get stopped. They take every stitch of clothes and dirty underwear and everything out of my suitcase and it just spread all over the place. And of course I get, you know, interrogated and, you know, None of my buddies told me to wash my clothes before I left, you know. <laughs> they set um, you up. <laughs> yeah, they set me up. And um, so I was there for a while, and then they pack all this stuff back, and they put the biggest red zip tie I've ever seen in my life, and they zip tie my suitcase shut so nobody could open it. Wow. And I thought, well, they're going to go out back and burn it. I'll never right. see my stuff again. So, I, you know, hours later, I finally get on my plane. I finally get to BWI, and sure enough, there comes my luggage. and It's got this huge, massive zip tie on this thing. But it was uh, it was quite it was quite the experience. Wow, wow! And they are deadly serious. Yeah, very very serious. But that is amazing. So. That is amazing. Well, so Ray, tell us uh, so tell us a little bit about your. So you've shared a lot of great information with us today. Really appreciate the uh, the stories and the knowledge. So tell us a little bit about your organization. So you you said you have a facility in uh, Alexandria. Right. So we so our main farm is in Lothian, Maryland. Okay. And that's that was where we started. That's called Green Street Growers. Okay. And we're about a sixty five acre farm. Uh, we, you know, we produce all types of seasonal color and and perennials and things. Um, we have a retail garden center there mm-hmm. um, that's you know open seven days a week to the public, and then we have a second retail location. Uh, in Alexandria, right off of uh, Braddock Road. Okay, used where to, is, it used to be called the Apple House. It's it's right across the street from T.C. Williams, and I know they just changed the name of T.C. Williams. And so yeah, so T.C. Williams High School. It's now Alexandria, Alexandria City, City High, High School. School. Yeah, yeah so your so so your retail center is in right across the street from Alexandria. Literally right across the street. Okay. Okay. And, uh, and uh, so, uh, and your new location is on Route 1? We call it Bellhaven because it okay. backs up to the Bellhaven uh, golf course and things. Yeah. It's right there. So um, do you have the same inventory at, uh, but I know you probably have more inventory. Uh, have more inventory in Maryland. Right. Braddock, um, because of space, it's just tight and the diversity. But we're bringing trucks in constantly to restock, especially right. in spring. And is Bellhaven going to be kind of a mirror of the uh, Braddock Road location? It, it is. Um, the only issue there is it's all outside. Right. So we're on a piece of property that can't be built on. Um, mm-hmm. And there used to be a nursery there, you know, 100 years ago or something. Right. We could have the same footprint. Um, so if it rains there, it's a little a little bit harder. But, yeah, we're building that up, you know. Um, and a lot of people are asking about when it's coming and, and what's going to happen. And we're trying to have all the parts and pieces um, – because, you know, it's hard to get around down here, right? Traffic. Mm-hmm. Now you got fuel, right? So people yeah. don't want to go to five places to get around. Right. When I first, when I bought Apple House, which is what uh, the Braddock store used to be called, um, they had a pretty, you know, had a pretty good list of products. And, mm-hmm. and I was like, you know, we really need all this. They've all these different sizes of impatience. You know, we had six different sizes. And yeah. and now we probably have 10 times the SKUs that we have because <laughs> – you like to garden this way or you like to use, you know, fish emulsion or mm-hmm. this person likes to use this. And right. all, all those different things work, you know. Um, it's no different than having your favorite brand. You know, my mom, when she goes to the grocery store, she still buys the same brand of the same things that she did when we were a kid, you know. Mm-hmm. And then there's one right next to it. It's probably the exact same thing, but she's going to always buy this one. Right. Know? I'm the same and, way. Yeah, loyalty. So it's, it's loyalty. Yeah. Brand loyalty. loyalty. Yeah. So, um we try to make sure that, you know, whether you're a master gardener or um, you like, you know, different types of soils, or right? we, we try to have a little bit of all of it. Right. Now, do you have people at these facilities that are experts that can answer so questions? So we have great we have great staff. Okay. And we have full-time, part-time, you know, people. Um, we have a lot of good salespeople out there to try to answer your questions and mm-hmm. help put some of the designs together. And, you know, have somebody come, oh, I want to do a little bed in my yard and, you know, we'll lay all the plants out in the cart, and then when they go to the cash register, they're like, "Don't move the plants because they got to go. They got to go exactly <laughs> like this in my yard." Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we have we have a really good staff, and good. Uh, we go out to our commercial job sites and tries to visit and try to make sure we're coaching the the landscapers. We do all the all the baskets in Georgetown, all those big pink pink baskets that go down to M Street. Oh wow! And let me tell you, that's not an easy job. We're I out bet. there working with the landscaper. You know, it's hard to. Get into them to water them at night. We do a right. constant liquid feed program. We use a fertilizer that um, it's called Nature Source, 
and it's actually the soybean extract of the oil. Mm -hmm. And the reason we do that has a much lower salt level, so that it's easier for the plants to survive the heat and you know the wet and dry that they get. So right, right, right. So yeah, we 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 try to have it all. Um, we have things in there. In, in Maryland, we actually just started selling uh, uh, raw dog food. So one of the other COVID results was everybody got pets mm -hmm. and what they've what people have realized for you know through research is a lot of the commercial dog foods that are out there are not the best thing for your dog because they cook right. all the nutrients out of them right right and chewy in those places can't ship raw because it's raw right right and um and a lot of people bring their, a lot of people bring their pets they bring mm -hmm. their kids but they also a lot of people bring their pets mm -hmm. you know to the garden centers and it's you know it's a it's a day out for the family right 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 or it's a new couple and they just started with it. so we added this everybody thought the nursery was crazy it's not a real big footprint but we have a nice little footprint and we don't have anything from china everything is mm -hmm. made in the u.s mm -hmm. um and the raw the raw food is has really uh been quite amazing mm -hmm. uh, we feed less you know but mm -hmm. it's much more healthy for your dog and uh, we also have these raw bones so don't ever give your dog a bone that's been cooked right or because it'll splinter right um but they can literally eat a raw bone right. because their stomach acid is like one yeah. you know, out of ten. And that's what they did, right? That's that's what they did, right? That's how they lived. Let me tell you, yeah. I got a big Roddy. You know, he's 120 pounds. Oh, I love Rottweiler's dog. favorite dog. And uh, let me tell you, I pull, that, pull one of those raw bones out of the packet. Holy smokes, I won't see him for hours. Yeah. You know, his eyes get as big <laughs> as dinner plates. Just don't try to take it away from him. Yes. <laughs> so, You'll lose a finger. Yeah. But, uh, so, yeah, we want all those parts and pieces. Part of it, too, in Long Island, I learned, is agritourism, mm -hmm. which is where you're bringing, you know, the public onto your farm. Right. Um, so we do that. We have a huge fall festival uh, in Maryland. Starts the middle of September through the end of October on the weekends. We bring uh, school groups in for, mm -hmm. you know, that. And they get to spend the day on the farm, you know. You'll get your 30,000 steps in. We'll make sure. We, we try yep. to send you home dirty and tired, <laughs> uh, maybe with a couple pumpkins and stuff. But right. uh, there's a corn maze, and there's all different types of agriculture or all different types of pro, uh, entertainment. One of the biggest things, which sounds crazy, is the corn pit. The corn pit is a shelled big box full of corn, mm -hmm. you know, tons of, you know, uh, bushels of corn. Mm -hmm. And the kids get in there, and it's like sand, right? Yeah. But the dexterity, you know, it's, it's really uh, – kind of interesting to the kids and um and yeah they go home and they got corn coming out all the way from our place to the to the bathtub <laughs> um mom and dad gotta love cleaning the car after oh, yeah, that trip you know, huh? but it's uh <laughs> but it's fun it's fun to get them out because it really gets people to understand we we have a lot of customers that come from dc mm -hmm. to visit the farm come out you know we're in south county we're, we're 17 miles south of annapolis it's beautiful right you know it's 30 minutes for D.C., depending on how you drive. Right. Um, we got some great restaurants out there. Come out and spend the day in South County and, yeah. you know, get some food and have some fun with your kids and pick a pumpkin and uh, do the maze. And we, we opened a – we have a, part of our property is, is wooded. So we went in there and cleaned up a good portion called the Woodlands. Because when I was a kid, I would say, hey, Mom, I'll see you tonight. And we go – me and my buddies would go in the woods all day. Yeah. She'd have no idea where we were, right? Yeah. No cell phones. And you came back when you either got – hurt or dirty or hungry hungry <laughs> and um so we created this area called the woodlands so they can do the corn maze and go in the woodlands we have some you know some fun stuff to do but it's just getting out you know yeah. it's just getting out there and touching nature a little bit and um it's a great way to reduce stress and a great way to bond with your family get some pictures and you know see that you know we've got a bunch of farm animals you know goats and things mm -hmm. and you know it, I guess for as close as I am to all that stuff, when I see people come in and visit sometimes, I'm kind of shocked that they're so disconnected from that. Yeah. You know, you can just see it on the kid's face or, yeah. you know, or, um, or even the parents and stuff. You know, they're just blown away. They see a pansy field full of millions of pansies blooming. Right. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. Yeah. And um, so it's a lot of work and, you know, it, Probably don't make a whole lot of money on Fall Fest, but it's a way to kind of get us around the corner. It's a chance for the for our families to come out and yeah. and really spend the day. And yeah. So Ray, can, what's your website? So Green Street Gardens is GreenStreetGardens.com. Yep. And our commercial site for growing, which is uh, is Grow Green Street. 
fantastic. Yeah, no, super easy. So every person I've ever met who is very successful is very passionate about what they do. And I can see the passion in your face. I see the passion in your eyes and the folks listening can hear the passion in your voice uh, for what you do. So Ray, we really appreciate you coming in. It's been uh, great uh, hearing your uh, story and, and learning about some of the things you do. Is there anything else you want to add to uh, our conversation today before we close Just out? Just get, get on. Everybody's been in, stuck inside. It's been a cold winter. Let's, you know, let's get out and get and, out and uh, do something. Get out and do something, yeah. you know, and, and uh, break a sweat a little bit and, you know, have a glass of wine or whatever you like and, and just enjoy it. You know, my, we, we, have, you know, we're kind of like my parent, my wife and I are kind of like the plumber's wife, right? And the sink always leaks because you're always out doing your job. Right. <laughs> you know, our backyard, it's been like that for like 10 years. So finally, right. uh, over the last, you know, 18 months, we really redid our, you know, backyard and put a lot of pots and eating area and stuff out there and made it really nice. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, my wife gets out there every morning and she, we have a ton of containers, you know, with all different types of plants. She won't let me touch it. Mm -hmm. You know, that's her time to get out and decompress and drag the hose around and roll it up and do all the things. Yep. Um, and she does a great job with it. You know, I'm in the, you know, she's more in the HR and, and that piece. I'm closer to the plants all the time. But, right. you know, it's her passion. You know, she can't wait to get out and take care of those containers. Mm -hmm. And once you get somebody hooked on that. And, you know, decorative containers are an easy way to put plants outside. Mm -hmm. And, you know, everybody goes, oh, those are beautiful. Or I don't know how to mix plants together. It's super easy. Mm -hmm. You need a thriller, mm -hmm. something in the middle, a spiller, something to fall over the edge, and a filler to fill the middle. Mm -hmm. If you pick plants and you go to a garden center and you say, well, let me see your spiller, fillers, and thrillers. You take whatever colors and, and combinations you like, buy yourself a nice pot, buy yourself a good bit of, you know, buy some nice soil. Mm -hmm. Um you'll be amazed mm -hmm. it's, and it's super easy. And then the other thing, when you're planting your garden or containers, you always plant in odd numbers, mm -hmm. one, three, five, mm -hmm. your brain works better. It looks, it looks um, more interesting. Yes. If it's an odd number, not an even number. Right, even number. right, right. So thriller, spiller, filler, and odd numbers mm -hmm. and a good soil mix. And that's the recipe for today. There it is. Ray Greenstreet, thank you so much for coming thank in. You. We very much Appreciate enjoyed it. our chat today. Yep, thank you. We just wrapped up a great conversation with Ray Greenstreet with GreenstreetGardens.com. Take a listen to his episode. You're going to really hear how passionate he is about gardening. If you have questions about gardening, send it to in the dirt at GreenstreetGrowers.com. If you want to visit his retail website, check him out at GreenstreetGardens.com. Ray Greenstreet, great story, great product, three locations, one in Maryland, two in Virginia. You can find them online. When you get in touch with them over there at Green Street, let them know that you heard them here on the Go With John Show.